All right, everybody, let's kick this off. Uh, this time we're going to do a black hat style introduction for our next speaker. So, laser beams, laser beams, unsa, 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 unsa. everybody get ready for the best, amazing, most cyber talk ever. Laser beams, laser beams, laser beams. Pew, 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 pew. Please welcome Cat Murdoch presenting Black Mirror. You are your own worst privacy nightmare. <laughs> I thought I told you to set a low bar, man. Low bar. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Uh, as you now know, you are sitting in Black Mirror. You are your own worst privacy nightmare. Uh, we're going to go through this in like a bit of a narrative way. It's involving a lot of story points to hopefully wrap up and bring us all to the main goal of the talk, which is just recognizing the... Um, the areas of our life where privacy is leaking that we may not realize exist at all. So first, hello, I'm Kat Murdoch. Uh, for the past few years, I've worked on red teams doing social engineering and penetration testing. Uh, this talk draws on those experiences uh, pretty heavily. Um, I am constantly curious. I'm really interested in where um, our actions leave us most vulnerable. In my spare time, I like to threat model my life. My husband will probably attest to this. Um, <laughs> I like to make sure that we have plans like A through Z sorted out, and so I have to know, you know, where are all of our vulnerabilities. Um, so I really try and take our professional curiosities in the community and apply them to our lives. Um, also really like my dog. I currently work as a security analyst on GuidePoint's threat and attack simulation team. Um, Woo, go, go team. I don't know if anybody's here. They were very supportive of me. I'm very grateful for that. Um, so the goal of this is to recognize the vulnerabilities that are created in our lives by using multiple services. Uh, we're going to do a nice little like Black Mirror Netflix theme, but we're going to draw this out into other areas of our lives as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about some tips for mitigating these issues and these vulnerabilities in your life. And hopefully we'll learn through some entertaining stories um, and... A lot of research that I put into this specific uh, talk here. So it's going to involve a little bit of a hard, deep look at our current reality and how we are impacting our own lives and how our family members are impacting our own lives. I know personally, like, um, I have a stepdaughter and she is, you know, growing up in this technologically really advanced world and it's really challenging sometimes to break down these privacy points for her and proper security as she is essentially learning how to craft her own digital image. It's really hard sometimes to thoroughly underscore how our own actions and your own actions online um, and just continuing to live your life can really like affect you on some deep levels. So those interactions with her have gotten me thinking a lot about how can these lessons and how can looking at privacy and our own vulnerabilities from different angles really be mitigated and affect, and affect positive change in our lives. As many people in this room probably know, um, I guess like if you work in privacy, can you raise your hand? Woo, thanks guys. Um, so I want to be really clear throughout this that I am so grateful to all privacy professionals. Um, they advocate for policies that help us, and they do this within the confines of their companies and their companies trying to make money and continuing to be the commercial giants or little contributors that they are. Um, and I'm so grateful for everything they try to do and everything that they want to do. Um, those things typically are, you know, privacy professionals, their focal points are within their own company and their own services. And we're going to explore kind of where those, those Lexus, like lexicons of control end, and therefore what happens on the edge where one person's privacy policy, like one group's privacy policy may be very robust. Um, but what happens when those services start commingling with other services? Um, and, in, you know, and then, in theory, end users get some choice over their own privacy. But at least, you know, and in this room, I'm certain that so many people are very aware of how their actions impact their privacy and how their actions impact their own vulnerabilities. But when we go home and we're talking to people, our friends who don't work in the industry, when we're talking to our family members, like, how do we translate these lessons and especially in a world where companies say like, oh, well, end users had choices. They're allowed to opt out. We gave them X, Y, Z, and they're making these choices. But, you know, really, like, 
do they? Um, there are a lot of things, especially for the lay person, that are extremely overwhelming from a privacy perspective. Um, you know, they can have a lack of knowledge. They don't understand where to look. They can have, you know, there are varying degrees of proficiency with technology and with applications. Um, they could just be, you know, have other priorities. Like, I'll be the first to own sometimes I know the right way to do something, and I'm like, I don't have time to spin up a burner email to register for this cocktail party for Black Hat. I'm just going to use this one because, like, this, the idea of doing this right now in the midst of my very busy work schedule is overwhelming to me. So that's coming from somebody who does this professionally. Maybe you guys are better than me and you've never slipped up. But <laughs> I know that, you know, where my family and friends are concerned, they just have, they're, we are all extremely busy and the world throws tons of things our way. So we have to be a little bit in, in, um, empathetic to that. And then occasionally there are really bad privacy policies or they don't cover, <laughs> occasionally, I'm going to be generous because I really, really appreciate the effort that privacy policies have. Um, but so even though they have this idea of choice and we can say like, oh, the end user can prepare themselves, like, do they actually have that ownership over their own privacy? And I would posit that there are so many layers to this, it's almost impossible to see for anyone where all of the risk could come from. So let's start off talking about like, what are some common services people use in their day-to-day -day life? Not from a business perspective, like, but each individual. Um, you guys are welcome to shout at me. Um, what are some things that we use every single day that our services other vendors provide? Email. Email? Instagram? Social media in general? Netflix? Thanks. APIs, yes. Amazon, instant messaging. Cell phones, medicine. So there's so many different services that impact our lives on the day to day. Namely, banking, we all need phone and internet, I think I heard somebody say that. Um, subscription media, social media, instant ordering, be that food or Amazon. I personally hate stores, so I'm a big fan. <laughs> and media and enjoyment. So these are all services that most adults in this room, out in the world, are using very regularly. And so each of these disparate companies, disparate services, they all have their own terms of service. They all have their own privacy policies. But do they think about all the other privacy policies that they may interact with? And that's often not the case, unfortunately. So we're going to focus in on two specifically. We're going to look at banking, which is regulated. They're very compliance driven. And subscription, where their policies often have to protect or work around what their user data is being used for. Um, you know, can we resell this? How do we obfuscate it? How do we aggregate it? How do we not make, how do we make sure that people are not identified based on their, um, you know, based on their watching profiles or their cookies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in these two specific things, it's so important because like outside of I think Michael Basil maybe, I'd say everybody in this room probably has at least one bank account in their actual name because otherwise we wouldn't get paid. <laughs> and so that is something that we're not, like we cannot avoid that at this point in the game. Um, and it kind of, so, and then 60% of the adult population pays for subscription services where like Netflix, like Spotify, like, um, you know, HBO Now, what have you, 60% of the adult population is paying for that. And then there are clearly, you know, like the 30 to 35% of the population that is just using one of those 60% accounts <laughs> in some capacity or another. So these two things are very pervasive. And maybe, you know, maybe people are like, oh, I'm never going to give my information to media. I don't have a subscription account. That's great, you do you, but this is more of an analogy towards the broader implications of using multiple services to just run our lives, which on a basic you know, financial connectivity perspective is unavoidable. We are all using services, we're all using vendors in our day-to-day -day lives. So, a question for everyone. What if you need to verify your identity with your financial institution? What do you need? Social security numbers? Sometimes your driver's license? Sometimes the debit card number or debit card itself? 
Address? Secret questions? Yeah, so all of these are ways that your bank may try and verify your financial information. Um, and this is not targeting one specific bank. I will backtrack to a little bit of my background. I've worked in finance for the past six years. I started my security career um, writing policies for essentially like merchant banks and investment banks. So I got to see a lot of like how the policies were written from that side. And then as a social engineer and penetration tester, I have worked with a lot of banks to see if we can circumvent their controls and access accounts or access aspects of the infrastructure that we shouldn't have, like, shouldn't be able to see. Um, so a lot of this came out of those very real experiences. So no two financial institutions may have the exact same, um, exact same verification questions or verification policies. But in my experience with a number of major providers, this is something that does affect many of them um, in this about to be very specific way. So what you need to verify, credit card number, social security number, account numbers, other stuff, those were all great ideas. But what happens if you're on the road? What happens if you don't have your account number memorized? What happens if you forget your social or you're in a really crowded area and you don't want to say it? How does your financial institution then verify who you are? What? They could send you an email, potentially. PIN number, potentially. They what? Yeah, they'll make sure, and the, if you call in, they'll make sure that that primary number matches the number on the account. Which, okay, these are interesting. Other places will often verify with knowledge of the account itself. Um, many banks, many financial institutions will assume that because you understand what is happening within the account, because you have a really firm understanding of the current balance, the most recent charges, et cetera, your date of birth, your address, your phone number, because you know everything there is to know about the account except for the number, many financial institutions will say, okay, that's cool, this is your account, you do this. So where does this meet Netflix? So what are the different defining qualities of subscription services? There are a couple of things here that all subscription services rely on. Preferences, did somebody say credit card? Recurring payments. And those recurring payments are of a publicly knowledge, like a, a, they are publicly known. You know exactly how much you're paying for Netflix every month. It, you know, maybe you do the family plan or whatever for Spotify, maybe you do the singular plan, but there are not very many iterations of these monthly services pricings, which immediately, so it's not necessarily your bank's job to think about the implications of verifying with something like a recent charge, but if we're all paying $9.99, every single month, and we can kind of figure out what time a month that charge occurs, any person who can figure out, figure out what service you use and when it renews could know a piece of information that could get into your bank account. And then how might we find out who uses these things? People love to talk about their subscription services. They love to talk about the music they like. They love to talk about the shows they like. And this is top quality open source intelligence, also known as OSINT. And it's everywhere. So one year of Netflix, one year Netflix subscription on 612, what day every month are they paying $9.99 to Netflix? Around the 12th. Got a Netflix subscription again. Time to re-up my HBO Now subscription. The key to successful campaign, everyone around, you know, big TV shows come out, Big Little Lies, Game of Thrones. These service, these service providers have an influx of tons of people. So now there are, you know, millions, hundreds of thousands of targets that we know probably signed up around these very popular releases. So we can slowly accrue all of this information about somebody's essentially like how we might be able to get into their bank account if we can figure out what bank account that is. And we can use this public knowledge of monthly subscription services to gain access to those accounts. I have done this personally into multiple bank accounts at multiple financial institutions. 
Um, it works really well. I personally kind of hate when people stand up and are like, I did this thing, just trust me. So, <laughs> as one does, I, um, <laughs> I opened up a special bank account for the sake of this presentation. Um, disclaimer, <laughs> I am not sure that this is an advisable move on anyone's part, and I need you to be very clear, I am not telling anyone to go out in the world and start a bank account to test their own security controls. I don't think it's illegal. I couldn't find anything that said it was wrong, but I don't necessarily advocate it. <laughs> so we're going to go on a little journey. I wanted to see if I could, using my own information, I opened a bank account using OSINTable information about myself, unfortunately, um, and I wanted to see if I could gain access to that account through improper verification methods. It was, a it was like pleasantly, slightly more challenging than I had ori originally planned on. Um, <laughs> But I didn't want to betray any like employers or clients, so this seemed like the safest way to prove the point um, without you know stepping on anyone's toes or making anyone any anyone particularly alarmed. I will say, yes, we can find subscription information online. We can find other OSINT online about the the account holders. We can find their birthday. If they haven't moved around a lot, we can probably figure out what area they open the account in. Uh, we may be able to find their social. Some states still release that on like tax liens, which is just batty to me. Um, <laughs> so if you live in those states, maybe go make sure that on the publicly disclosed tax liens, your social security number is not in the top corner, because often they will only verify with the last four. So some, if not all of these things, are ostensible. I tried to keep this like very, very basic. Um, and I did put some subscription services on this account for the sake of this talk. Thankfully, we had a lot of heads up. Um, so it's a multi-pronged attack. You do a setup call to make sure that you verify the most recent charge, and you're like, oh, I don't really know a lot of information, but I just got this like weird thing happen on my phone. Can I make sure my Spotify payment went through? Can I make sure my YouTube Red Premium, whatever it is, went through? So we're going to listen to a setup call where I call just to get information on the account to further my attack vector on my next step. So here we go. Thank you for calling. My name is Nath. You have your first and last name. You talked to how to pay from your account. I have to speak to Rudolph. And how may I assist you, Ms. Rudolph? Um, so I am traveling right now. I'm just like really crazy. So I don't think I had like my account number and stuff at the beginning. Um, I just got one of those weird text messages for a charge and I wasn't familiar with the vendor. I was wondering if you could like confirm what the most recent charge on my account is. Okay. I can definitely go ahead and confirm what the most recent charge is on your account. May you please just verify your full okay. address, including your state, city, and zip code? Uh, yeah. I'm not giving you my actual bank account, guys. My address. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. In just one moment, please, I'll access the account. And what was the amount of that charge? Um, I don't, it was like over, it was like a pretty, I think it was like a pretty significant one, but it might be like a monthly thing. I don't, okay, I wanted to just part. verify like what it is. Okay, so it looks for the, is it that one? Yep, that's okay. what it does. What is that? Just to throw it out there. Instead, she never had me verify it. I just stumbled my way through confirming what the amount was, and she was like, oh, was it this one? I'm sure, like, yeah, that seems right. That seems great. Do you see, like, the whole vendor name? It says, that is a monthly thing. Okay, cool. That is. Okay, okay, that makes me feel better. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. You have oh, and your actually, day. while I have you, well, I have you. Could you just verify what is my account balance right now? I feel like with between like that charge and then like I think I got paid recently too, so I just want to verify. Okay, so your balance is okay. Okay, awesome. Okay, that's good then. All right, okay. thank you so much. I appreciate you. You're welcome. You have a great day, and thank you for calling. So now I have. I know I, you know, if this was not my account, I would have verified I had the right address because it went through. I, you know, gave her the proper name 
And then she gave me my one ask. Can I just confirm this weird text message I got? Everyone gets the six digit text messages. And finally at the end, when she was all bought in, she'd already helped me. She felt super comfy in this interaction. I was like, oh, can you also tell me the account balance? Like I would like to know this exact other thing about the account. So now I have all of this great information to call a different teller because banks are giant places with multiple people and see if I can take it to the next level. I will say, shout out to that bank. Oh, I um, did get shut down once, but I wanna share it with you because in the process of getting shut down, one of the biggest things that I see in all of these cases of services leaking little bits of information and you know leaking your privacy just a bit on the fringes is that they, a lot of times humans don't realize the value of helpful information. Humans typically are trying to be helpful, especially if you're polite, if you're amenable, and they are all in for, um, for trying to be as helpful as possible within the confines of what they believe they're allowed to do. So we're going to start with the shutdown because it does happen, but there was a really valuable little tidbit thrown in while he was being like, nah, bro, I can't do that. As far as like getting the account number, um, without having to go to a branch, it would be through the mobile app. Or um, I don't think I remember my password right now. You like, you can't help me. Like, I'm pretty sure. I can like, help I can you tell log into the, the account. Should have been. Got you, got you. Um, yeah, just you know, I get I get in a lot of trouble if I do that. Um. But I can I can help you get into your uh, mobile account and then help you find it. Most definitely, Miss Murdoch. Um, That's what I can do. We can try that. Uh, let's see if I can like multitask that one. So that um, if you could log in or if you need help logging, in, I can help you with that most definitely. Uh, what were you saying? The, the handle was uh, the user ID. Uh, Okay. Um, oh shoot, you know what the pro I don't think I can do this while I'm on the phone. Are you with Sprint? Yeah. So disclaimer, I'm not with Sprint, and I actually didn't know that Sprint was the only character to not let you multitask now, but now I do. Um, <laughs> but more importantly, he's sitting there telling me, like, oh, I can only help you log into the mobile app. I can only help you do this. Like, I can't tell you the account number on the phone. But in the process, I never gave him my user ID. I never requested that from him. And he offers it up. I did request it at the end. And he just offers it up to be helpful to log into the mobile app. So now, as the attacker, I have username, I may not have the password, but there are a variety of ways, some of which we'll touch on a bit later, to get that password once you already have the account access. You could probably find the email address associated with the account online as well, and you can slowly build this robust profile using the knowledge of other services and what um, the other services and what you learn on the phone calls to volley this into a much bigger attack. So then I called back because you can always get a sympathetic person. Um, the noise in the background is a track of airport sounds. <laughs> so if you need like a compelling phone pretext, I recommend you turn to YouTube. There are crying baby sounds or rent, I don't know, maybe you have a baby you can just use organically. Um, <laughs> you have a lot of airport, a lot of like loud keyboard clicks. So that really can seal it in. Um, it can really help other people be empathetic to your plight as you're gonna like storming to the next place. So I entered into this next compromise. I also did this with the shutdown saying that like my mortgage payment had failed and I needed some help to make sure that I could pay. I'm on the road, you know, like you know how bad it is if you miss your mortgage payment. Like apparently it happened last month too. So I really need to figure this out right now. As far as like getting the account. Good afternoon, um, welcome to without having to go. Can I have the first and last name on our valued customer as it's on your account, please? Yeah, uh, my name is Murdoch. You know what's really funny is that's actually my cousin's name. Good afternoon. Shout out to Whitney Merrill, uh, Whitney Maxwell. She's in the room. She did that exact line on her winning SECTF calls last year. So I was like, I'm going to give her a little shout out. Um, saying that you know somebody with the same name as an instant rapport builder. It invites them into your tribe. And now they feel like they have this connection with you. So I'm all like, oh, yeah, I know that person. I have somebody with a similar name. Um, pro tip, if you do this, don't concatenate it to a nickname. I recently, they were like, oh, hey, my name's Ginger. And I was like, 
my cousin's name is Ginger, but she goes by Ginny. And she was like, oh. And I was like, I did not realize <laughs> that this was like stepping on some toes, my bad. <laughs> so anyway, back to this. Welcome to May I have the first and last name on our valued customer as it's on your account, please? Yeah, uh, my name is Murdoch. You know what's really funny is that's actually my cousin's name. <laughs> that is funny. It's an unusual name. Great. How may I help you today? Um, so I'm in a little bit of a bind. I'm so sorry for like the background noise. I'm actually traveling today. Um, so I thought that I had my mortgage set to like auto pay, but now I'm being told by my mortgage provider that my payment didn't go through um, and that they need to verify the account information. And so I don't have access to my account number off the top of my head. Um, I was hoping that maybe you guys could help me get, get verify what my account number is. I can go ahead and check our options over the phone. Can I confirm the address on the account? Uh, yes, ma'am. It is. So we're getting a lot of the same questions. Like, these are things that I already know the right answers to. I'm like, heck yeah, I tested this. <laughs> Great, Ms. Murdoch. And what are the last four digits of your social security number, ma'am? Um, so I am not comfortable giving that out right now because I'm surrounded by so many people. Um, is there some other way we can go about this? Mm, okay. Let me see. Um, I can ask you three other questions on the account. They'll be random. Hold on. Um, before I do that, what is your birthday, Miss Murdoch? Um, it is What is the current balance on your account, ma'am? Um, I think it's like, I think it's like. You think or you know? I need the, I need the exact amount, ma'am. Um, okay. As of, as of earlier, it was. She thinks I'm just as scattered as I pretended to be. <laughs> okay, and what was the last charge on the account? Um, oh, that's easy. I just saw that, like, my monthly, um, that would have been. Great. And finally, what city and state was the account opened in? Uh, it would have, it would have been. Thank you so much, Ms. Murdoch. The number on your account is... Literally every time this happens, my blood runs cold and I have to go take like a 15-minute walk. Um, yeah, thank you. Hopefully I can just go ahead and get this paid and like it won't be an issue while I'm on the road. Um, yep. Thank you so much. Of course, is there anything else I can help you with today? Um, no, that should, that should probably be it. I appreciate the time. Thank you for being a valued customer. Have a good afternoon. So suddenly, because we know all about these other pieces of information in my life, whether it be, you know, you found some, I don't know, voter records are a super helpful place for OSINT. That's another service that we use if we want to vote. We have to give them our information. You can find birthdays. You can find locations. You can find addresses through that. We know our monthly service providers. That is... Uh, we, we've already discussed, you know, we know exactly how much our Netflix is. We know probably how much the Spotify is. And though this can be done in just the three quick calls or two quick calls that you guys listen to, you know, really savvy and committed attackers will keep calling back until they get, like, I've been in situations where I don't have the answer to some of the random questions, and so I have to call back and be like, okay, well, let's try this again. Uh, maybe I don't know your horse's name. Like, <laughs> Or maybe I do, depending on your Instagram use. Um, but so you have these, all of these like very, very vulnerable pieces from different service providers that they may or may not realize exist. And quite frankly, it's not your bank's fault that you use Netflix. It's not Netflix's fault that you charge that to the bank. But it's incumbent to us as the users to pay attention to these things, to understand that they're happening, and put our critical thinking hats on on where could the gaps between these services that we use exist and how can we fix them. Um,
Oh, stop. So this is not a one-off. This happens to other services we use as well. So it's not just banks and subscriptions. It's, you know, that's a really fun one to use in the context of like, I can actually pull this off as a case study for a talk. Um, but it also happens to like, happens with phone porting scams, which is essentially you call the Verizon or AT&T, which you can find very easily on like freecarrierlookup.com, where, who owns this number? And then you call them and you tell them there are oftentimes very, very, very few security controls on asking for your calls to be forwarded. Maybe you're going out of the country and you're not bringing your phone. Maybe you're coming to Black Hat and you don't want to bring your phone. You call them and you ask, hey, for this week, could I just have all my calls forwarded to this new number? And they're generally like, yeah, okay, that's fine. Um, but what else do your phone calls do? What else do your phone calls are they used for? If you use Outlook, you can oftentimes do your two-factor with the phone call. And they'll call you and they'll tell you, like, oh, here's the, you know, here's the code. It is one, 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 one. And you're like, oh, man. So now suddenly these things start to snowball. And again, it's a maybe a little bit the phone carrier's fault. Like, they should not make that so easy. But <laughs> they're not really thinking about your phone number and calls to your phone number being used for multi-factor authentication. Should they be? Maybe. Do they? No. Should we? Absolutely. Um, the other one is like all text messages, all network carriers use the same SS7 um, network to send text messages over. It's relatively easy to intercept. There are a lot of vulnerabilities that affect text messaging. So now your two-factor authentication via your text message, which I'm I'm positive many people in the room know is not like the preferred method. You should definitely go with token-based authentication methods when possible, but not all vendors allow that. Not all financial institutions allow that. They're not like, yeah, sure, go duo, go use Authy. They're like, we can either call you or we'll text you. And that's it. Or we'll email you. And all of these have like major problems with them occasionally. So this intersection between different services, be it Netflix and Black Mirror, be it, um, be it your bank account, whatever, these intersections are like where we are going to lose our money, where we are going to get into desperate times. This has happened with a ton of people with Coinbase, um, Bitcoin wallets, like cryptocurrency is a huge target for, S uh, for SS7 interception and text message interception. And then once your Bitcoin wallet is gone, it's gone. There's no tracking that down. Um, so this is not a one-off. It affects almost all our services that commingle, especially telecom and banking providers and financial institutions. And another really great case study is in 2016, a group of children, basically, which I'm, there are brilliant teenagers. Um, there's a group of three 15 to 17 year olds who call themselves crackers with attitude. And they ha were a hacktivist group and their general messaging was that they wanted to free Palestine. To do this, they decided it would be a great idea to hack a bunch of three letter agencies um, and also compromise the director, then director of the CIA, John Brennan's accounts. And they did this by using the lapses between um, between different services. So what they did first was they called Verizon, his telephone provider that they found out using free carrier lookup or something similar. So they called Verizon and they were like, hey, I've got to do some maintenance on John Brennan's account. Can you please confirm some account details for me? Including the last four of his, so of his visa card, including his handle, all the information they could possibly get from Verizon, they got and then even if somebody at Verizon reported that some shady stuff happened to Brennan's account, what would Verizon have done and how would that have helped with any other vendor that they would then use this information with? There's really nothing. There's nothing that Verizon in this day and age could have done. So then they took all of that information, the last four of the account number, the birthday, the phone number, et cetera, and they went to his AOL account. And they logged into his AOL account. And in his AOL account was all of the information for when he got onboarded with the CIA, which quite frankly, again, don't know why people would do that. Um, <laughs> it's not ideal, but people do. Your loved ones may. And sometimes we're like in a moment of harriedness. You're like, I'm going to forward myself this email because I need it on the road or whatever. And suddenly you have something sitting there that really shouldn't be there, but it feels, you know, maybe right now it was OK. Um, so they overtook his AOL account. They locked him out of it, and they found all of his onboarding documents and leveraged them against him. 
The kids have since been arrested, but it's another, it's a great example of how we can use these different services to essentially do account takeovers, get extra information, and really compromise and mess with someone's life. And I don't want any of you or anyone I love or anyone I know to be one of those people who gets hosed because of this like very nebulous gray area between services. So recap. Remember that any service or provider you use is only responsible for their own privacy terms, and quite frankly, as we have seen, they don't always do that super well. <laughs> and so this leaves each individual to take care of their privacy themselves. If we look at something like the Equifax breach, that really underscores the necessity. Equifax is a service that adults did not say, I know what I want to do. I want to open an account with Equifax. <laughs> that was not how that happened. <laughs> and yet we all, you know, so many people were negatively affected from that breach. Um, so we have to remember that all of these things touch our lives, whether we're constantly thinking about them or not, whether or not we're watching Black Mirror every night or what, I, what have you. Grace and Frankie, it's great. Um, <laughs> but all of, the dar all of the other little bits of our lives that are being logged, that are being looked at, that are being used, those are entry points into our, our, our lives, our well-being, our financial happiness, and they should absolutely be considered in like your personal threat model and that of your family is to make sure that you're not John Brennan. He was the director of the CIA. Like he should have been a champion of professional like decorum and security and like this really hurt him. So, it, you know, any of us are vulnerable. I truly believe that every person in the whole world under the right circumstances could be socially engineered to give information that they didn't intend to give. And all of these wildcard people work at all of our vendors, and we are wildcards ourselves. Like, we don't necessarily know when something's going to go sideways. So trying to maintain that active, like, threat modeling mindset and constantly staying on top of what could go wrong when we have the time to think about that is extremely important to your longer-term well-being and that of your financial security and family's financial security. So, like, own your own privacy. Sure, most people in this room do a great job of that. But social, a social engineer's obsession with OSINT, open source intelligence, like relies on poor privacy hygiene from users often. It relies on those moments that you want to, that you're excited, and sometimes that's hard to contain. Um, but when you can't contain it, be very aware of what you're choosing to share with the world and who can see it. Um, so recognize where individual services privacy policies are supposed to cover you. Try and recognize how they're actually covering you and where they are not actually covering you. Um, and like your vulnerability is in the connection of these privacy policies or one of them. It is the most often overlooked in my experience. And then question your role, like the role in your own privacy. Question your role in your family's the privacy, recognize that the surface is always changing. The policies themselves are changing. How organizations conduct business is always changing. And how it affects you positively or negatively is always changing. Um, so make sure that you are owning your own privacy and, you know, try and do routine hygiene checks. Like pick a day every quarter or a day every month to say, like, what have I signed up for? What is new? What might have been shared? Did somebody else share something about me? Um, oftentimes when there's information on it, like maybe your aunt, like Uncle Joe tagged you in a photo on Facebook and it was public. And then you can't go and untag that because Facebook's rules are ridiculous. And so everyone can go and find out where you were tagged. And now, you know, the world knows a little bit about yours and Joe's relationship. And that's not your fault, but it is very helpful to be able to explain to people why that might be a problem and why it might affect you or them negatively. So what to do? Observe and analyze your actions and those of your loved ones. Um, you know, like... I, one of my best friends was saving passwords in a truly nauseating way. We had to have a nice little sit down about sticky notes are not proper password management tools, whether they're on your computer or on your physical desktop. Like, no, thank you. Um, don't share what subscription, subscription services you use. And I'm not saying don't share them with your mom or your sister, or your brother, or use your moms or use your exes or whatever, though it's probably like ill advised. What I mean is like, if you want to share a song that you really like publicly, 
Do you have to link it to the, the, the service you actually use? Do you need to share it directly from Spotify or can you find it somewhere else? If you're really excited and you really feel like you need to share, how can you do this while protecting your own OPSEC? Um, if you do want to share a song or video, it's like find a public link. Find something that doesn't show you're using premium.spotify.com. Um, and then use token-based multi-factor authentication. Use Duo, use Authy, use Google Authenticator. Try and avoid the SMS and call-based um, two-factor wherever you possibly can. And then most importantly, because that's not always possible, make sure you call, especially your telecom and your financial institutions, call them and have them put a passphrase or a verbal passphrase or a PIN number on your account. Try and make that PIN number at least six digits. And in theory, before any information is given over the phone, they will have to ask you for that exact passphrase or that exact PIN number. Um, this will prohibit things like uh, call forwarding, text message forwarding, um, and a lot of ways that SMS multi-factor authentication is like circumvented. Um, and also, like, please stay in touch. Um, I love making new friends. I really value friends, so feel free to come see me, say hi, let's chat. You can follow me on Twitter, at Kat Murdoch, that O is a zero. Um, and then email cat.murdoch, O is still a zero, at protonmail.com. Um, I'd love to hear from any of you. And then we hopefully have a few minutes for questions. Um, so if anybody has any questions about the presentation, other bits of curiosity, I am all yours. So just let me know. Plenty Thanks. of time for questions. Yeah. And please walk up to the human microphone stand. If you have mobility issues, I will bring the mic to you. Come on up, join the party. Hi, super big fan, by the way. <laughs> hey, girl. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question for you is, when it comes to like knowing the questions that they're going to ask, do you just kind of wait to see if they ask it? If you don't have that piece of information, you're like, oh, okay, like note that for later and try and come back and get it? Or like, how do you find out all the questions that they're going to ask so that you can kind of decide your path to like gaining all that information? Yeah, that's a great question. So oftentimes... If it's for a client and you're doing it routinely, or if you're an attacker and you have all the time in the world, you'll call and you'll ha you'll see what questions they're asking. I typically, personally, like combat a lot of nerves when I do phone pretexting calls or pen tests or whatever by finding way too much information. <laughs> so I try and equip myself with all the information I can possibly find online. Sometimes you don't have that luxury, but yes, I will keep calling until I build out that, like, okay, what questions am I going to get? How can I find the answers to these questions? And then can I call back enough times to at least, because generally they'll have a bank. When I did policy review and had more insight into how it actually worked, usually they have a bank of a handful of questions, and they're going to ask you some, as the woman said, like some number of those questions. Um, and so my hope is always to kind of be able to find like 60 to 70% of the answers, because then the odds are in my favor. Um, and yeah, sometimes you don't have that luxury, and you have to like kind of like BS your way through it. I, uh, we recently had to, I had to reset a password and we had absolutely no indication of like what the questions would be, but we knew there would be questions. It turned into a 30 minute call and they wound up asking me like who my manager was, but the person I was impersonating was new and like this is not directly related to this, but very much like how you find out these questions. Um, so I knew the person was new and I called and I just pretended they were like, oh, well, what day did you start? And I was like, well, I signed my contract like four months ago, but I started really recently. So I don't really know what it would be there. And they're like, oh, actually it's not here. Like apparently because you are new, like things got messed up. And I was like, cool. Yeah, it must be the case. And um, <laughs> then they kept asking like the next one was, oh, can you tell me your employee ID number? And I was like, well, as I said, I'm like in a Starbucks, just met with like a potential new hire. Like I don't have that memorized. Like what else can we do? And they put me on hold like a number of times. I was like, surely I'm burnt. And they'd come back <laughs> with another question. And it got to the point where they're like, well, who's your manager? And I named someone else in HR that I'd seen online. And they're like, well, that's not your direct manager. And I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> and I was like, well, what about this person who's like this, the like head of it all? They're like, no, you poor dumb thing. And I was like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing. 
Um, and so they went so far as to call my manager and pull him on the phone and asked him to verify my voice, to which he said, yeah, that sounds like her. And I was like, what? <laughs> so a lot of it is perseverance because I would be lying if I said during one of the like seven moments he put me on hold, I didn't want to hang up real bad because I was just like, there's no way this is going to work. And then at the end, we like pulled it out and he gave me this passphrase. I reset the password and we got in. I was like, that took 30 minutes. I cannot believe it worked. Um, so it really comes back to like that tenacity and you do call and you make sure that like, you know what, as many of the questions as you possibly can. And maybe you'll look out and it'll be the ones you know off the top of your head. I did try for the sake of this, like be really authentic. And I didn't, like I only used information that I had called and obtained, or I know you could value find online. It was an interesting, it was an interesting experiment. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, so just to flip this around a bit, have you had any experiences where you called a call center and it was effective security? So something that they did, maybe an OTP via SMS, I don't know, um, or something like that where you thought, hey, that's, that's pretty secure, maybe I'll move my money here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some, some institutions have really robust security questions um, and that can, like, like you're just not going to find them online. And some people are super well trained and you will have them say like, we are instructed to not give the account number over the phone because that is typically what they're not supposed to do. But you know, maybe you're a new mom and you called somebody who was once a new mom. And so now she's like, oh, your baby's crying. Like I know this pain and it's, it's like a little bit terrible feeling to like prey on those emotional times. But like in those moments, if there is not something as binary as I cannot access the information on the account until you give me this, in, until you tell me this pattern, Passphrase or PIN number, um, that is a really effective way. But honestly, the effective security aspect tends to be removing the information from the teller until they get proper authentication. Like, don't let their emotions be manipulated or influenced. Um, so on, on the screen, the most effective thing I've seen is like, I cannot see your information until you give me this one answer. Because if they can see it, then now they have a choice as to whether or not they reveal it. So if you have like a pop-up that says, here's the question, and you must put the answer in before the teller or, who, or the call, the person who received the call, uh, just, they just literally cannot see anything until you get the one or whatever very secure question correct. And that is the most effective security I have seen like repeatedly. Just to follow up, that's primarily A, right? That's what? That's primarily knowledge-based questions and answers. But have you seen anything technical like an Authy push notification or Google Authenticator OTP in your experience? From my perspective, specifically with financial institutions or, or telecom companies, I have not seen that on like the person to person level. Um, like with, I haven't even seen it on the corporate accounts, quite frankly, but I'm not saying it couldn't exist or hasn't been implemented some places since I tested them or maybe it's a place I've never tested. But in my experience, I have not found anything that is that technically advanced, um, to protect you, like end user accounts. Sadly, it's a great idea. <laughs> I'd love to see it be a thing. <laughs> Hi, great yeah. talk. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. Um, I guess I have a follow up kind of that as well as the original question, which is that a lot of those like OTP token based authentication systems, I would think you'd run into a situation where, like, for example, my phone, you know, it got erased for some reason and now it just basically collapses into the same yeah. threat model as before, where now I can basically get them to remove that second factor from my account. So I, that'd be a scenario I'd be worried about. But one of my, my, my original question was, uh, is there a kind of a breach boundary style approach that you would recommend? Like, you know, you mentioned before having burner emails. Um, one thing that came to mind when I was listening to your talk was like, oh, if I just used uh, different credit cards for different types yeah. of services where, oh, maybe they can go and figure out like how to compromise my whatever card, but not my other, not my debit card, for example. Like, is there a, an approach that you would recommend? Um, so first off, going to give like Michael Basil a plug. He just released his new book that is like how to be invisible in America, um, like a guide to privacy. And if you really want like expert level privacy tips, go read his stuff because he is truly amazing and also maybe like a bit extreme and extra, but like 
power to him. Because yes, you absolutely could. You can also go and, you know, you can withdraw cash and go and buy the prepaid credit cards and buy them for a year and use that for Netflix. So like Netflix will not be able to leak information about you. Uh, you can use Proton Mail. You can actually like create and spin up like a fake Gmail account because they're like usually you're supposed to have another email address and or a phone number to start up a Gmail account. Um, but if you can put in your phone number and then later remove it in settings. Um, and so then you have like a semi disconnected Gmail account that is immediately like uh, service providers are typically like, oh, it's a Gmail. That's pretty like that's pretty legit because they have all these precautions in place. Um, so you can do that, like absolutely, you can obfuscate it, you can put your house in a trust so the mortgage is paid, um, not in your name, and that's not a way to find out your address. There are tons of like little ways that you can absolutely improve your personal privacy and your personal privacy posture. Um, you can make, um, you know, like even do like a 33 mail email, which will allow you to put like infinite subdomains at the start of like username at subdomain dot 33 mail dot com. Um, like all these could like, I'm, this casual advice could still be linked back to your identity, but it would keep your, you know, crown jewels and your finances secure. Um, and so that would be, if you really want to go to that level, I would say like, go get cash, get your, you know, Amex points from like the little Amex card from Kroger or wherever you shop for groceries. And then you can be like, all right, I'm going to put 10 times 12 like dollars on this so I have the exact amount I need for a year and then I'm going to set a, an alert on my f on my phone to make sure that I like re up to a different credit card at the year mark or whatever you would have. So there are absolutely ways you can get around it and there are definitely ways that you can like increase your security. It also comes down to like back to the end users having choice. How much time do you want to put into it? Like where is your baseline risk? Also like if you use if instead of using your debit card, like I'm not endorsing anybody go out and get a credit card to rack up a credit balance, but the, uh, credit cards like American Express will often, like they don't, they, they will protect, you know, your information slightly better. They will generally like give you your money back if something bad happens to your money because of one of these things. Um, and so I, you know, I appreciate the vendors who are like, yeah, crap happens. Like I'm going to help you not feel the negative effects of this quite as much. They'll, they'll never hear you on the recording. Oh, no problem. Does the recurring payment on a prepaid card work? I was under the impression that that like they check against that now. On a phone or an account? I was talking more for like the service accounts. No, like if you were to go to the supermarket, get like a prepaid Amex, like could you buy Netflix with that? I thought like they don't like that because it's used for like money laundering or something. Um, potentially, I'm, I, I cannot currently speak to like every single person, like every provider's policies on yeah. what types of cards they will or will not accept. Oh, okay. But like also these subscription services also have their own gift cards that you can also buy with cash. True, true. So yeah. like if they say boo hiss, I don't like this card because the digits say it's temporary, um, then just be like, all right, well, instead I bought this Netflix gift card with cash, loophole. So yeah, absolutely. And I mean, sometimes right. people will not, like sometimes uh, fields won't like certain email addresses because they feel shady or like with Gmail, you can put a plus sign at the end of your username and have like limitless usernames. But some vendors are like, oh, I don't like this because I know that you can make like limitless usernames. So you definitely have to stay on top of what specific vendors requirements are and they do constantly change. Um, I even like with my gym, I did the plus thing on an email address and now they have put up a precaution that says like, oh, you can't use the plus sign rule. And so now I can't reset my password at my gym because it says that it's not a valid email address. And I was like, oh, this is a weird loophole I've gotten myself into. So yes, <laughs> there are moments where it's like non-ideal and you have to continuously, like if this is a commitment you want, if this is, if you, depending on how secret, secret squirrel you want to go, um, it does take a bit of work and a bit of maintenance, but to not lose, you know, all the money in one account or making sure you keep that money in separate accounts so if you lose a little bit. Like there are multiple strategies for how to keep yourself safe. But I recommend investing a little bit of time in those things instead of relying on the vendors to do it for me because that clearly has a lot of a lot of areas for improvement in their privacy policies and how they interact with one another. Thank you. All right. done? Thank you so very much. Thank you Great guys talk. so much for coming out. I really appreciate you all.